There will come a day for every employer to have to deal with misconduct. So what is required by employers to deal with misconduct in employees fairly? This is Stuff Employers Should Know. Welcome to Stuff Employers Should Know, proudly brought to you by LabourNet, management's ultimate HR solution. Welcome to the podcast. Yes, sir. Yes, like it. Yes, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. He's over there pushing the buttons. And I'm Barry Gordon Davis. And this stuff employers should know. This week, we are dealing with a how-to episode and dissecting uh, how-to specifically when it comes to the procedural aspect of disciplinary hearings. I'm joined by Amos Mukuruperi, an IO manager at Labanet, to help me dissect what employers should know about holding a fair disciplinary hearing. Welcome to the show, Amos. Thank you very much, Barry, and thanks for having me. When the employment relationship is entered into, both parties get rights and duties, or you can call them obligations, to which they must adhere. The employer is entitled to the employee's labor, and the employee is obliged to supply it. The employee is entitled to remuneration, and the employer is obligated to pay it. So employers have the right, and in fact, it's more of a duty to maintain discipline in the workplace. And this duty is recognized by the Labor Relations Act, or the LRA, which we can call it. And this contains a code of good practice, specifically with regards to dismissal for um, applications of misconduct in employees. It also includes, obviously, misconduct, uh, incapacity, and poor work performance. But the function of discipline in the employment context is to ensure that individual employees contribute effectively and efficiently to the goals of a common enterprise. So employers have the prerogative to implement rules, regulations, and procedures as they see fit and unilaterally, provided, and and to, to comment on the enforceability of these roles, is that employees are aware of the rules, which is usually done through a disciplinary code or policy, whether the rule is then valid and reasonable, and that the rule is then consistently applied by the employer across all employees. So in order to enforce the rules and regulations set by the employer, the employer uh, may issue a series of sanctions which are intended on correcting an employee's behavior or conduct. These range from verbal warnings, written warnings, uh, you get the proverbial final written warning, and then ultimately summary dismissal for, of an employee. Now, should there be any dispute about the fairness of a dismissal for misconduct? or even in some instances regarding the issuing of a sanction short of dismissal, the commission or a council will assess the fairness on both substance and procedure. So where I speak about the why or the enforceability of rules, today we are going to be focusing on the procedural fairness of dismissals or issuing sanctions due to misconduct. So focusing on the process that is followed by employers. So when it comes to addressing misconduct, uh, Amos, why do employers have to have a disciplinary hearing? Look, employers would have to have a disciplinary inquiry. Uh, this is on the premise that both parties would need to be given the right to obviously defend themselves on the part of the accused party and obviously the employer being the complainant and or the initiator for that matter, would obviously uh, need to advance the company case in terms of proving the allegations against that particular. And it satisfies that that Latin phrase of audio terum partum, which is here in the other side. In the event that we wouldn't do a dismissal inquiry, obviously it would eat against what would later on be argued to have been a procedural defect. And if we argue around the procedure, it then becomes difficult for us to prove the substance thereof in terms of the outcome being fair. Yes. There are... In terms of the LRA Schedule 8, um, it also states that there can be an extenuous circumstance that may prevent an employer from actually um, having a hearing. And, and how the Act basically says is it may dispense of procedures in extenuous circumstances. Um, what would that be, for example? Look, the, the reality is that um, it, there's never a requirement that in any outcome, for that matter, needs to be from an inquiry having happened. This is the event, for example, if you were to issue a warning to, a, to an individual then it would prove no sense to actually have a full-on hearing if it was only based on a hearing to which the accused party himself would have not been an argument. Obviously, as an extension to that, there'd also be situations where the misconduct itself is so serious in nature to obviously um, have with it the effect that the employee, say, for example, if you use unauthorized absence, 
if if we are to obviously dispense of uh, the inquiry part of it, it would then be in the lines of being able to ensure that the employee in any event has been given a chance to state their case, irrespective of a hearing actually happening. So the law, in as far as just not inquiries are concerned, it needs to be remembered that hearings are not a prescript of the law. All there is a requirement of is that the both parties need to give a chance to talk and obviously um, state their case. And if that would happen outside a hearing, a hearing space, then there still would have been a covering of a procedure where the person would have been allowed to submit submissions on either end. And obviously the substance thereof would have been proven by the part of the employer. And not to mention if the employee who is going to be subjected to procedures is then, let's say, acting in a threatening manner to the other parties or is in an abusive manner, um, the employer can then show that they have attempted to give them an opportunity to state their case. Or the nature of the fence, as you're saying, was so, um, I say, say, severe that it would actually maybe endanger the lives or safety of other employees by um, having them near. And re- so you remove them from the process and you might be able to then go straight into um, dismissal from there? Look, it, it still is a requirement on the part of the employer to ensure the safety of uh, the staff whilst at work. This also obviously speaks to the LRA in particular, where the employer is duty-bound to ensure the safety of their staff members. So, for example, if you've got a threatening employee that obviously has threatened, uh, and I'll use a weird example where people are likely to be shot at or killed for that matter, then obviously the employer, as part of his duty, um, as bounded by the LRA, would then obviously not necessarily have to have that inquiry, but obviously the substance thereof would not have a take away from the fact that even if the inquiry happened, the outcome would have still remained the same. Yeah, but we would then go in, obviously, to, uh, if they say there's a dispute about it and there's a dispute resolution, we'll go and say, well, here's the circumstances that prevented us from going through the normal traditional hearing process, and we obviously then had to dispense of it um, and, and go through with the substance. Look, Barry, the nice thing about the type of law we are dealing with here is that it's on a balance of probabilities as opposed to what you'd have in a criminal law type of setup where everything would have needed to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So in this particular case, there would still be justification from the employer in terms of why an inquiry would have not happened. And if the justifications are obviously in line with the fear, in the example I made earlier on, where other employees would have been at risk, then it could still be such that the outcome thereof, from a commissioner point of view, is still fair. So, okay, so dealing with that, I mean, that's an extenuous circumstance, so... But for all other purposes, we need to have a hearing. So let's let's start at the very beginning. And hearings always start off with a notice. So at the notification stage, how and when does the notice get issued? And what should such a notice contain? Look, the easiest way to explain uh, this part of things is that the law is very punitive. Every termination needs to go through a process of some sort. Obviously, with the acceptance of things like resignation, there is no process to follow there. So in as far as a disciplinary inquiry is concerned, an employee would need to be subjected to that process by virtue of first being issued a notice. It's very important as to what is contained on the notice. Uh, what should be on the notice is obviously who the employee in question is, who should then later on be referred to as the accused party, where on the same notice there needs to be a list of rights that the employee or the accused party would have to enjoy as part of the disciplinary inquiry to ensure that procedurally it is fair. Then, of course, we need to highlight what the actual allegation is against the accused, we need to keep this as straightforward as possible, easy to understand, to allow for the accused party to be able to prepare for their own inquiry. Yeah. And obviously so not too long, but not too short. It's sufficient particularity. Sufficient, yes. And obviously the, the date and time as to when the inquiry is going to take place would then be in line with when the actual notice was issued, which the rule of thumb would be 48 hours before the inquiries uh, would, would obviously proceed. And obviously, if if uh, we give exactly 48 hours, the accused party or other party, for that matter, would have to then go and show good cause as to why they would require an extension of that period, for example, or postponement and the like. So what about um, getting an employee to sign, uh, accepting, acknowledging such a notice? Look, the signing of the notice would obviously confirm acknowledgement of receipt on the part of the accused or the employee. And and not wanting to sign such a notice would then not nullify the actual allegation against the accused party. Yes. At this point, the employer can then get a witness to confirm that the accused party was actually issued the notice. So, yeah, it's a but, common occurrence that the the, the employee uh, feels that by signing the notice, they're almost accepting the guilt or or the like with the charge. So they'll do so almost out of principle. But the actual signing is signing 
ac- accepting that they have been notified of the, of the charge and that we have notified them as to when the hearing would be. So your witness would be there to effectively prove that they have been notified. They'd have to prove that they've been notified of their rights and notified as to when and where the hearing is going to happen so that we can then prove in the event that the, the party chooses not to participate that we can then obviously show that we have correctly notified them. Look, like I said, the signing of the notice basically acknowledges receipt of the notice. It is not confirming guilt on the part of the accused party. And in any event, the inquiry would still happen to which the accused party will still get a chance to defend themselves as we would have described earlier on in terms of Schedule 8 of the Court of Good Practice. Yeah, I've, I've heard scenarios where employers add charges of insubordination for refusing to sign the notice um and i mean it's the right of the employee they cannot sign but at the end of the day it's not signing accepting it it's as you say and i think we've exaggerated the the extent that it's notification opposed to accepting it so let's talk about representation um most, what's the most uh, common situation for employers with representation the representation um first of starts off by by obviously acknowledging the fact that the matter would still be an internal affair uh, on the part of the employer and obviously the employee. So the rule of thumb is that whatever is dealt with internally would obviously need to go with representation being that of an internal person to whoever the accused party would have been. Um, there has been situations uh, in between where obviously the accused party would then argue, I want outside representation. But bearing in mind what the rights would have been on the notice to attend to begin with, there would have been confirmation that the internal uh, inquiry would have have to go with representation being that of a fellow employee or a shop steward for that matter if there is a collective agreement in place. But um, it's obviously important to note that despite the fact that the employer makes the rules saying no outside representation will be accepted or allowed, um, it's up to the employer on the day in front of the chairperson to either then accept outside representation, but also for a competent chairperson, it, it should be noted not to, on face value, just say, well, I'm not going to allow it. Like with every process, give them an opportunity to state why there might be appropriate reasoning to have outside representation. In the inquiry itself, if the parties to the process actually are in agreement that there will be usage of outside representation, then there's nothing wrong there. The chairperson thereof also would not even need to make a finding to that effect because the parties agree on their own. But in the event there is a dispute between one party wanting to have representation and the other party obviously disagreeing to the fact, then a chairperson would need to apply their mind in the sense of taking submissions from both parties to understand what privileges the other party would obviously suffer without having this outside representation to which then a finding would be made to confirm whether or not it will be granted on the part of the accused party. Yeah. And, I, and I find that most of those applications usually get done on the grounds of comparative ability where you know you might have an employee that's representing themselves, uh, yet the complainant is a seasoned, uh, let's say, HR professional or attorney themselves and the like. And they might go and say, well, look, I need assistance in, in, in that way. Um, and that should be considered. Yeah, obviously those are the situations where such uh, findings would be made by the chairperson, which obviously stretches not just only internally within inquiries, there's the same applications that you'd get at the CCMA and the bargaining council for that matter. So based on comparative ability and obviously the public interest of those type of cases, one would then need to apply a mind in terms of a chairperson to ensure that there is no procedural defect as, as, a, as a part of that inquiry later on in argument. So it's very important not to just shoot things off at, at face value, but obviously understand the context and, and the reason behind why such, such submissions are made in order to have later on been uh, in situation to ensure that you can confirm fairness on both procedure and, and demonstrating substance. not being biased. Okay, there is a burning question when it comes to representation and specifically representatives of shop stewards um, in particular, does a shop steward uh, have automatic representation externally by a union official, even if the notice says no outside representation will be allowed? Look, the easiest way to understand and, and obviously answer such, que- such questions is obviously on the back of whether or not there is a collective agreement and what that collective agreement says in respect to the discipline of any shop stewards. If the agreement goes as far as saying automatically a shop steward needs to be represented by a union official, then obviously that, that, that would apply. But there is nothing in law that says if the shop stewards themselves are confirming in the inquiry 
that they are comfortable in leading their own case without the assistance of uh, a union official, it would then be later on seen as a, being a procedural defect. So in any There's event, no automatic there right. There is no automatic right. 100%. And then that timeless question, the accused party or their representatives fail to arrive. Now, look, um, there's, there's obviously a case where every disciplinary inquiry needs to be dealt on on its own merits. Um, there could be situations where the charge or the allegations against the accused party is a dismissible offence. Now, in respect of the code of good practice, bearing in mind that the reason why we have disciplinary inquiries, obviously, as first price trying to correct their behavior, there is nothing wrong with the employer on first occurrence in terms of non-attendance postponing the inquiry. Obviously, if it is more a dismissible offense, because you will never know what would have happened to the accused party for them not to have been able to attend. So it is very important. However, if the charge is for their absence and their continued ongoing absence, it might be a bit punitive to the employer to then have to postpone. Then obviously, yes, there will be such situations where if the charge speaks to exactly what is happening in the inquiry, then it makes no sense to postpone because the reality is I'm charging with the same thing that you've just now done. Now, uh, what about a representative of an employee, whether it's internal, external, or the like, uh, that becomes unruly or disrupts the proceedings? Look, it's very important to remember that the inquiry is that of the accused party. So in situations where the representative, be it internal or external for that matter, doesn't really um, affect the process, it is one where the person or the representative needs to be cautioned against such behavior by the chairperson where they are notified that going forward, should they continue in obviously disrupting the process, they would then obviously be asked to leave. So it's very important to understand that the representative is, is not necessarily the accused party, and as such, the process needs to be respected by both parties, including that of that representative. Okay, so that's discussing some of the topical issues around disciplinary hearings. Now let's run through the process or the, the, the procedure that will happen on the particular day with, with a chairperson chairing a disciplinary hearing. And we know the chairperson has a lot of uh, uh, aspects that they need to deal with. So let's run from the beginning. Starting with procedural matters, what does the chairperson have to ensure? Okay. Number one, it's very important to understand that chairperson actually owns the disciplinary inquiry in terms of allowing both parties a fair chance to make submissions. Now, how the process starts is obviously by the chairperson introducing the parties to the process uh, where we understand who the accused party is versus who the complainant is. Yeah, they're impartial, so they wouldn't they, know who's playing what role in the proceeding. 100%, because if, had, they know, had they known of such information before the inquiry happens, then obviously there would have been an argument around whether Bias. the chairperson is neutral or not. Mm. So from having done the intros, the chairperson is then required to go through a couple of prelim uh, matters to confirm, obviously, comfortability on the part of the both parties to ensure that the inquiry can, can flow. So it's very important to start off by understanding whether or not there is a need for an interpreter. It's always a good thing to start with that. Um, I've seen chairpersons make a rookie error of going through all the procedural matters. The very last thing that they ask is, do you need an interpreter? They say, yes. I mean, it nullifies all the previous questions that are asked. 100%, because that's where we start the inquiry. If there is obviously a communication gap in terms of not understanding, then that's where we need to obviously allow, as part of the rights of the accused, an interpreter to be part of the process. From there, we then need to confirm whether or not the accused party was actually issued the notice to attend the inquiry and whether or not the accused was obviously issued the notice within 48 hours to have allowed for them to be able to prepare for their own inquiry. And now they've refused to sign that notice. What did we do in the event that we've now got a notice and it says employee refused to sign? There would still be a follow-up question to that where the chairperson would still confirm with the accused party whether or not they are comfortable to proceed. Okay. Now, remember, by virtue of them being in the inquiry, it means they knew of the inquiry. And yeah, if somehow they, confirm, they, they caught wind of it, yes. And if they confirm, yes, I'm comfortable to, to proceed with the inquiry, then obviously the question around whether they would have signed or not signed, therefore means nothing to anyone. But what we generally do is grab the witness that, that would have seen it. And I think the witness is more... Yes, notified, as you say, they arrived, but really to go and confirm that they correctly notified and confirm those rights of them. It's very important for a chairperson to always have the accused party sign as they're going through the prelim matters to ensure that later on it is not argued that the accused either was not aware of the inquiry or what the charges would have been and the refusal, the, the refusal to sign that disciplinary inquiry notice 
would have then meant that the procedural aspect of the uh, of the hearing would obviously be argued later on. I think a side note of saying bring your witness that that witnessed the the issuing of the notice and reading out of the rights and the charge to the party. Make sure that it's an employee that's going to stick around because you never know. You're probably going to need them in a couple of months' time or even, you know, we go through procedures that even might go through the labor court. It could be in a couple of years' time. It's always nice to make sure that you have one of those employees that what you don't just grab as they're running around the, the corridor or rather go and grab somebody that you know is, is, is going to be there for the long term to, to, to testify uh, having witnessed the correct issuing of the notices. Look, and I, I, will, I can't agree with you any more there because at the <laughs> end of the day, we've had witnesses that would have been um, obviously fruitful witnesses to have to have had, for lack of a better word. And later on, the witness either is no longer there or becomes a hostile witness. So it's very important in the selection of witnesses that you obviously select someone that you can trust yeah. to obviously ensure that. And take note of who it is. I've seen a lot of people say refuse to sign and then they say that they had a witness, but they couldn't remember who that witness was on the day. Because, you know, as I said, it happens uh, um, so much uh, so much later. So make note of it in the in the minutes and make note of it in the, in the, the record of the hearing. 100%. So uh, we, we then confirm... Uh, all the preliminary matters and basically the chairperson is then effectively determining whether the matter is ready to proceed. There's, the, the accused party has been correctly notified, they're aware of their rights, they've confirmed that they've had enough time to prepare um, and they, you know, the chairperson is now comfortable that we can proceed. That's when we're heading to the pleading stage. So when we get to the pleading, uh, obviously we'd start off by having the chairperson read out the charge to the accused party in terms of ensuring that the accused understands what has been allegate, alleged against them, after which there obviously would be a question as to whether or not the per, the party um, being charged, or the accused party rather, um, obviously acknowledges or confirms. Uh, <laughs> did you do it or not? <laughs> did you do it or not? So that would obviously be the recording of the plea, whether the person pleads guilty or not. Yes. So depending on the plea, obviously the chairperson would then uh, go on to explain the process to unfold, obviously still maintaining both parties need the same right to be obviously heard and defend themselves on either party. Now, it's been my experience as well that uh, when you ask the, the question to ensure that they know what they are pleading to, uh, and you say, oh, do you understand this charge? I do get it on many instances that they, they just claim that they don't because there's this fear that by saying, yes, I understand, is almost confirming that they're guilty of it. And I find myself having to explain, well, no, I first of all want to find out what you uh, that you understand the charge and then I want to find out your plea. Don't stress, I'm still going to hear whether you plead guilty or not. We still have to hear both sides of the story. Um, and we struggle to get over that hurdle. And then they'll say, no, I don't understand. For me to then say, okay, well, guilty not guilty they say not guilty and then i say well what you you just said you don't know what you're pleading to so i know that that's a bit of a hurdle but it's a necessary one so as you say the process does change slightly when it comes to uh depending on the nature of the 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 plea but as you've confirmed you still hear both sides of the story there has to still be a fair and equal opportunity for them to state their case and um what but but firstly where there's a guilty plea uh, what's the way of dealing with a guilty plea when there's a guilty plea, um, you'd find some chairpersons obviously deal with it differently. It is uh, now this is now in in a case where there's a guilty versus a not guilty plea. So in an in a not guilty plea, um, obviously the, the the burden of proof still remains with with the employer in terms of obviously proving the allegations against the accused yes. party. Uh, obviously, the flip side to that is that if there is a guilty plea, you still hear the case as a whole to then confirm as a chairperson whether or not that plea was accurate on the part of the accused party. Yeah, so it would actually be incorrect of the chairperson just on face value to say, okay, well, you're guilty. Um, I'm, you know, it removes my uh, requirement to make a finding in this regard. Look, without being technical, obviously there still needs to be evidence pieces in relation to the inquiry, obviously with the allegations thereof. And unfortunately, an admission is not necessarily evidence that can be relied on by the chairperson to confirm guilt on the part of the accused. So the inquiry would still need to proceed where the chairperson, confirming having applied their mind, would confirm whether or not the accuser pleaded guilty correctly so or, or not. And then with the not uh, guilty plea, what, what is the, the, the order of presenting evidence? 
So, so where there is a plea of not guilty by the accused party, uh, what is the order of presenting evidence? And just take us briefly through the procedure followed of giving everybody a fair opportunity to state their case. Now, should the accused party plead not guilty, the burden of proof would be on the part of the complainant or the initiator and the inquiry to prove the allegations as set out on the notice to attend. So... In hindsight, we then start with the accused, with the company submissions rather, where the company leads evidence by virtue of an opening statement and obviously with whatever witnesses they might need to call to confirm that the accused would have been guilty as a result of the allegations against them. Once that is done, we'll then allow for the accused party a chance to question the submissions made by the company and or any witnesses that they would have been called by the company representative being the initiator or the complainant. After which, we still allow for the same opportunity to be given to the accused party to share what their defense is in relation to why they would have pleaded not guilty and submit evidence to that effect as well. Once that is done, we'll then allow for the company uh, representative as well to obviously question the submissions of the accused party uh, and any witnesses if there would have been any, after which both parties allow a chance to then make closing submissions in relation to summarizing their case basically after which a chairperson is then required to make a finding on the allegations as to whether the accused is guilty or not guilty. Okay, so the, the, the chairperson can find that the for each one of the charges, uh, make a finding of either guilty or not guilty. Are there any other findings that the chairperson can make with regards to charges? Look, um, obviously, if, if we are to narrow issues, one would either be guilty or not guilty, but there are situations where a chairperson, for example, cannot make a finding due to insufficient evidence having been provided by either one of the parties. In particular, in this case, the alleging party being the complainant or the initiator. So there is situations where a chairperson might fail to make a finding on the premise that there was no evidence or there wasn't enough evidence to have obviously confirmed guilt on the part of the accused. Now, once the finding has been made, obviously if it's a not guilty or insufficient evidence, the process will then end there. However, or get uh, taken on by the employer when there's insufficient evidence to go and then either then go and determine if there is further evidence or it will then end there. But... Um, where there's a guilty finding and the employee has now been found guilty of one or more of the, the charges that have been brought against them, how does the chairperson then make an appropriate sanction? Okay. Look, the sanction of a disciplinary inquiry is made up of two things. It's first the finding itself, which the chairperson would have confirmed as being guilty on the part of the accused, for example, where if that's the case, then they would need to go on to take on what we call aggravation and mitigation circumstances. So in, in, in essence, an outcome of an inquiry is made of two, two things, being the finding and the consideration of mitigation and aggravation for the chaplain to have been able to arrive at an outcome of the inquiry. And in, that's where the chairperson, in considering aggravation and mitigation, makes use of that very famous case that's probably one of the most famous case laws in labor law, which is the Sudumo versus Rustenburg Platinum Mine case, where 100%. it provided guidance as to the totality of circumstances that a chairperson must consider in order to determine what is an appropriate sanction. That's a landmark case. It's not only is it used in disciplinary inquiries internally, but obviously at the CCMS and even at labor court, the same notion is applied in terms of considerations when it comes to aggravation and mitigation on the part of the accused and or the applicant, depending on which process you're sitting at. Now, once the chairperson then delivers sanction, for example, um, and the, or the employer delivers sanction, what is the appropriate manner to give the outcome of the disciplinary inquiry? The outcome needs to be in writing, number one. And the outcome also needs to be inclusive of the rights of the applicant or the accused party in relation to whether or not they would be happy with such an outcome. So, for example, if the outcome is short, one short of a dismissal, meaning it's a warning of any type, the accused would then have a right to either appeal internally, should there be an appeal procedure internally, and or approach the CCMA or the bargaining council for that matter within 90 days of having received such an outcome. If the outcome happens to be a dismissal, and obviously the accused party is not happy with such an outcome, their right would still be either you appeal or you can appeal and or go to CCMA or the bargaining council within 30 days of having received such an outcome. And that's a, a question that I want to ask, and possibly the final one, is is there automatic right to internal appeal? No. 
a, an employee or an appeals party can decide on their own accord whether or not they would want to appeal internally or they would want to move out of, of the scope of the internal application of an appeal to obviously approach a CCM or a bargaining council in the event they might feel the outcome would still remain the same if they appeal internally. So it is not forced on any applica applicant or accused party for that matter to appeal just on the premise that there is an appeal procedure. Now, I think the biggest takeaway from this, and we've run through everything, topical issues, then through the actual process, that was, I think the biggest thing that we need to understand is where we do do sessions like this and we show how to when it comes to all the specific aspects. The biggest thing that we can understand is, is that in ensuring the Audi Arterum Partum rule or the, the, the right to be heard, it is a complex process and it's, and it's some that an employer should apply a competent chairperson to do. But uh, thank you so much for your time, Amos. I think that we've uh, really learned a lot with regards to the ins and outs of disciplinary inquiries. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Barry, and thanks for having me once again. So that's it for this episode of Stuff Employers Should Know. As you can see, it's a very complex topic that we were discussing today. So get in touch with us at sesk at labinet.com if you need any further information about it or if you need us to assist you in any way with regards to the chairing of disciplinary hearings. And as always, please hook us up on social media and uh, let us know what you want to hear. And uh, that being said, from myself, BGD, and yes, till the next show next week, stay safe and cheers. Stuff Employers Should Know was proudly brought to you by LabourNet, management's ultimate HR solution. For more episodes from Stuff Employers Should Know, go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you play your favorite shows. Case law or statutes referenced in the podcast are current at the time of recording.